I'm Paul Simon. I'm the Head of Public Affairs at Suffolk Chamber of Commerce. And with me for the third in the Chamber's patrons interview is Alan Pease. Alan is the Principal of Suffolk New College. Alan, just, just to kick off, um, just describe your own background in your, in your associations with the region. Yeah, sure. I um, graduated from Manchester Metropolitan University in 2001. Mm. Um, and my degree was in Business Management and Sports Studies. Mm. And it was born out of a lifelong love of sport, whether that's participating or viewing. Um, and I think I've tried to apply many of the principles that I've learned through sport into leading a business. Mm. And there is an absolute synergy, you know, the team working, the leadership, the communication. Um, I, as soon as I graduated, I worked up in London for about eight months. I was a trainee underwriter but quickly realised that's not where I was destined to be. And I wanted to use my degree. So I, again, through good fortune, there was a local college that had an opportunity for a sports lecturer. So I joined FE in 2002 and I've been there ever since. I've worked across four colleges in Essex and Suffolk. Um, and I've been in senior leadership roles for the last decade joined Suffolk New College in 2008 as Deputy Principal and became Principal and CEO in May this year. We'll, we'll, we'll touch on team building uh, as a key element of, of, of building a business and relating to other businesses, but you, 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 you mentioned you became Principal this year and I think it, it really does behove us to j just just reflect on Viv Gillespie, your yeah. predecessor's legacy, who mm -hmm. sadly um, passed away earlier this year. I mean, what impact did, did, did that have on you and your team and the whole college family? Oh, it was devastating. Mm. It came as, as a real shock. Viv told me in December that she'd be stepping back at Christmas because she was unwell. And in typical Viv fashion, she was very stoic, very understated, said that she'd be stepping back and that she wanted me to act as interim principal um, from January. Uh, never really told anyone how poorly she was mm. and I remember it really clearly. I took a call from Malcolm, his husband, on the 31st of March and it was a Friday afternoon. It was about 10 to 4. The college was pretty empty. It was the last day before the Easter break and um, he, he said that she'd sadly passed surrounded by friends and family. Mm. Um, and, and then my role shifted again. It was about not only navigating the organisation through the transition, but also mm. managing the grief. Mm. Um, and, and there were various opportunities that we've had subsequently to, to remember Viv and, and mark her contribution, not only in Suffolk, but she was a principal across five colleges, the length mm. and breadth of the country, from Northumbria to, to Worcester to Plymouth. Um, but what a legacy. Yeah, and absolutely. in terms of Suffolk New College, if you look at, the legacy that she's left she's delivered a merger with the otley campus which is now suffolk rural um, and that that college eastern and otley college was in dire financial mm. straits when when we acquired it um, and was rated for inadequate by ofsted so within a space of two and a half years she'd stabilized the finances delivered the merger we got our ofsted good and I think we're all proud that we were able to collectively secure that legacy for Viv. And it is an amazing legacy. And I know it's one yeah. that you're, you're, you're building on. You, 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 you mentioned, um, uh, obviously, Suffolk Rural. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I, think, I think it's sometimes forgotten that you, you front up quite a large business employing hundreds of people across a range of sites. Yep. Can you just take us through the challenges that you face as the head of, of that scale of business and that kind of complexity of business. I think that's a really good point. The scale of the business mm. is something that needs stating. So we're an employer of just shy of 800 people now. It's about a 50-50 split between our academic team and our business support mm. teams. Um, we're across four sites with the main campus in Ipswich and our rural site at Otley. And then we have two sites on the coast and Leyston and Halesworth. Um, the organisation turns over just shy of £32 million pounds a year. Mm. Um, so we're, we're a you know, pretty decent sized organisation in any sector. And the, the challenges 
are, are sort of many in the education sector at the moment. There's been a chronic underfunding of FE for the last decade. Um, hopefully that's, that's starting to shift. We've just had a, an increased injection of funding this year that we're going to use on staff pay because we do need to stabilise where we've got staffing shortages in some skill shortage areas, um, but also we really need to retain good staff. Mm. Um, so we're really happy that that injection of increased funding is going to go to stabilise our workforce. Do you, um, do, 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 do you think that um, there has been a sea change that will last in terms of policy makers, locally, regionally, and nationally who, who recognise that actually FE has been the poor relation to the detriment of our economic and social prosperity. Absolutely, and the, the country's got an enormous skills agenda at the moment mm. to boost the economy, and FE colleges are going to be at the forefront of developing those skills mm. in the young people. Um, hence why part of my role, and a big part of my role, is, is around managing the stakeholders I work with. Yep. Uh, and one of the main pillars that I set out when I was interviewed was around stakeholder engagement and management. Mm. So I want to engage with our civic stakeholders, our community stakeholders, mm. other education partners, mm. but probably most importantly as employers, yeah. because we're yeah. creating that future workforce mm. and we need to hear from employers mm. um, because we need to be able to shape that workforce mm. so that they can join businesses and add value immediately. So how would you classify relationships with the business community and with Suffolk Chamber? Yeah. How would you want to see it develop and deepen and broaden? Mm. So we launched back in um, February our industry partner program, mm. of which the Chamber are a, a, a registered industry partner. Um, and that has grown and we now work with over 300 employers. That could be in a range of different ways from an employer coming in and delivering a guest lecture to a group of learners, to offering work placements, apprenticeships, um, so we're working more than ever um, mm. with our employer partners and it's a core part of our business now. Mm. Ofsted grade mm -hmm. the effectiveness of FE colleges in meeting skills need. Mm. So it's incumbent on us to do it, but mm. also we take pride in doing it because I think FE's opened its mind to what our function is. Mm. So it's no longer about just getting learners through qualifications. Okay. It's actually almost reverse engineering that and asking the learner, what their career aspirations are and then working back from that okay. and making sure they've got the right skills and qualifications to be able to achieve their career goals. So how do you measure that value add then? You, you, get, you get cohort after cohort after cohort yeah. at, at the age of 16. Yeah. If you're re-engineering maybe their view of themselves and their relationship to work and their careers, mm. how, how do you judge success? And that becomes much more complicated. It is, got a baseline. There are a range of KPIs we use okay. in terms of their academic attainment. Mm. So we look at, hey, are we retaining the learners? Oh, okay. So are they staying in learning? Are they staying in education? Mm. And that's one of the national benchmarks mm. the college are measured on. Then is, are they achieving the qualification at the end of it? Mm. Uh, and then we look at their destinations. Mm. So are they progressing on to further study, mm. whether that's with us through the levels, mm. um, whether that's onto university at level four, five and six, mm. or whether that's into meaningful and sustained employment. Mm. And what I mean by meaningful and sustained is, you know, if a young person's trained as a bricklayer, mm. they're going into bricklaying. Sure. Um, sure. And then are they being retained by that employer and are they adding value? Mm. And, and are employers are quick to tell us if our leavers have the right skills to be able to contribute to, to local businesses. Mm. So it's very much about working in partnership now. Mm. And we need our employers to engage with us really early on in the learner's journey, you know, not just be there at the end sure. to, to employ them. Sure. Actually, by getting involved right at the start of that journey, they can shape those skills um, because, again, it's their future workforce. And, and, and of course, in terms of the current administration, one of its sort of signature initiatives is the Local Skills Improvement Plan. Indeed. Um, as you know, regionally, um, that has been managed by um, this chamber and our colleagues in Norfolk. Yep. Was, was there a sense from, from your perspective and your management team's perspective that how very day, how very dare businesses and chambers actually sort of get involved in sort of, yeah leading um, uh, conversations on aspects of the skills pipeline. No, not at all. Right. Actually, it should be businesses that are leading on skills. Right. Um, and I think that's where FE has evolved 
and it is the FE and skills sector. Yes. And I think the priority for so long has been on, on the FE bit, which is the qualifications, that the skills have been neglected. Yes. And, and we also manage quite a tightrope in terms of qualification mm. and skills because qualifications are still how we are funded. Mm. They are still the currency that mm. learners use to progress. But a lot of the qualifications don't meet local skills need. Mm -hmm. So we've got to manage that tension between delivering a funded qualification, which mm -hmm. we absolutely have to do for a young person, mm -hmm. but also try and, without being funded through it, yes. uh, deliver the skills agenda as well. So yes. it, that's, that's a real difficult balance to strike. But actually it's easier if employers are telling us we need X, Y and Z. And in that regard, you, you've had some incredible um, successes, and, I, and I've noted them down, you know, the launch of the tech campus, yep. the health and science campus, yep. the Net Skills yeah, Centre. Skills centre. Yeah. Yep. How are all those going? Really well. Yeah. So the tech campus is two and a half years old now, and we have all of our provision for IT, games design, games art, and digital industries within that one building now. And it's, yes. it's very modern, it's very vibrant, it's Google-esque. Um, and it's a 21st century learning environment for young people. Um, and what we wanted to do with that, the intention was it not to be like a normal IT suite in a school, but okay. our learners feel like they're going into a digital industry. Yes. Um, so that's been a tremendous success and we're very grateful to the LEP for supporting with mm -hmm. that development. The Health Science Campus is a few weeks away from opening. Yep. And that looks from the outside very much like the tech campus, but a very different feel inside, very clinical, mm. looks like a hospital. So mm. it's a modern facility mm. with a mock nursery, mm -hmm. science labs, mm -hmm. um, a virtual hospital ward. Mm. So again, what we're trying to do with our estate is mimic the environment that oh, our okay. young people okay. progress and work in. Sure. So if they're doing a health related course, sure. it needs to feel like a, a health provider. It mm. needs to feel like a hospital or a social care environment. So mm. we're trying to replicate the facilities they learn into how they'll be when they progress mm. into employment. I mentioned the Local Skills Improvement Plan earlier, the LSIP. Mm -hmm. um, there is now something called an LSIF, mm -hmm. um, which, which you're very much intimately involved in yep. delivering. Can you just explain? Because for many businesses, it will be another set of letters, yep. but for me, it's another acronym they need to learn. Yep. Um, how important is it and what impact will it have? I think it's really important to deliver the promises in the LSIP. Ah. Okay. So the LSIP has, for Norfolk and Suffolk, and as you said, the chambers in Suffolk and Norfolk have led on that. Sure. I think it's it's produced a really good plan, okay. which highlights the skills need for the region. Mm. And what the LSIF, the Local Skills Improvement Fund, will now do mm. is fund projects that we can work um, collaboratively as a group of New Anglia Colleges and the University and, and East Norfolk Sixth Form College with the chambers and our employer partners to put some projects into life that are gonna develop these identified skills in our young people and adults. Sure. So we're really proud to be the sure. lead partner for that. Sure. Um, and we are looking forward to working collaborati collaboratively with all our stakeholders in delivering some of those projects, which will help that skills agenda. And in terms of longer term ambitions of the college, what is likely to be coming, coming along? And to what extent is the current political uncertainty Yep. Um, making that 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 sort of long term planning more more challenging, or do you feel pretty reassured that regardless of the outcome of the general election, whatever the political stripes involved, yep. that, that actually FE and line of sight of government policy is now pretty much set for the next four or five years? I I, I think that, that that's quite a complex one to answer because it is crystal ball time. I think. If I just articulate some of the key developments in FE, yeah. um, that might be helpful. So we've had the introduction of T-levels, which yes. is probably one of the biggest changes in, in the FE curriculum, certainly in my career. We've been an early adopter of T-levels and been delivering T-levels since 2020. And they're on a four year phased rollout with different routes being added each year. So we've embraced T-levels. Um, we like the fact that the qualification are a combination of academic and vocational technical study with a really sizable industry work placement within, which again gives us an opportunity to work with our employer partners. Mm. Um, and, and we ask that our employer partners think about taking on young people and work placements so they can help shape that skills agenda. I believe that's got cross party support and that should we have a change of administration, um, the plans for T-level will remain. 
we've discussed pay and funding already. Yes. Um, I said we'd had an injection of additional funding recently to support pay. What I was really pleased about that that was added to our programme cost weighting. So the fact that that's intrinsically linked to the funding formula, I think sets out a long term commitment to to fund FE. And again, I have no reason to believe that all political parties are not aligned to that because we have to deliver that skills agenda. I think the biggest risk to us as a sector is the ongoing curriculum reform, though. Okay. Um, where we've we've had T levels introduced, mm -hmm. and and the government are reviewing what the alternative level three offer looks like outside of T levels, A levels, and apprenticeships, um, and and there is huge value in some of the vocational and technical qualifications we offer, and we'd urge any party to think about the defunding of those qualifications because every year we will have hundreds and hundreds of learners that are on qualifications that are not T levels, A levels or apprenticeships, and they go on, achieve, progress on to university, progress into employment and add real value to the economy. So I think with a new administration potentially, um, one of the things we'd be encouraging is to maybe slow the pace of that reform mm. uh, and, and have a really clear understanding of the landscape before they make any decisions. And, and, and you'll know that um, you're, you're part of a Suffolk Chamber delegation that's going down through the kindness of Tom Hunt yes. um, to meet the current Minister for Apprenticeships and yes. Skills, Robert Halfen. Mm -hmm. Aside from that issue, what other reassurances are you looking for from the present administration? I, I will come back to the funding rate. And whilst mm. I'm encouraged that it's the increased funding is on the funding formula, mm. I think we'd be looking for a longer term reassurance that that will continue. Mm. Um, that there's quite an alarming statistic at the moment that the Association of Colleges are pushing around, and that is average pay for college lecturers versus teachers. Mm. And at the moment, the average pay nationally for a college lecturer is £33,000 a year, but for a school teacher, it's £42,000 a year. God. And, and I don't understand why that disparity exists because if you look at our college lecturers, they are academically qualified they have teacher training qualifications but they're also industry experts so many of our staff are not career teachers yes they've had a career in industry yes. and then they come out as professionals yes um, because they've got a passion for delivering learning and they add real value so i think some sort of reassurance that that will be recognized um, would be what I'm looking for. Good news, and we'll certainly put that to the Minister. Yeah, absolutely. Alan, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure.